with cerebral palsy. Many people with CP have impaired ankle function because of plantar flexor stiffness or weakness. This deficit leads to abnormal gait patterns. It negatively affects your walking performance, such as your walking speed or step length. More than half of the CP population will have a steady decline in uh, walking ability across lifespan, and many will even lose the ability to walk later in life. To improve ankle function and overall mobility, our lab previously developed an ankle exoskeleton that can, um, in, that can provide plantar flexion and dorsiflexion assistance during walking. We confirmed that this device can increase lower limb extension by 14 degrees and increase ankle power by 44%. In the meantime, uh, users with CP have reduced uh, plantar flexor ex activity working with the device. This is an undesirable outcome because it indicates that the users are relying on the device turning off the muscles, which could lead to muscle atrophy over time. Finally, all of these changes occurred after over two hours practice with the device, which is quite a long time. These limitations lead to the purpose of the current project, which is to use biofeedback to increase the effectiveness and increase user engagement during working with wearable assistance. We used, uh, we used step lens as a feedback target because it is clinically relevant. It is simple and intuitive, especially to child users. Most importantly, taking a longer step over requires increased muscle engagement and changes in walking postures. We tested on seven participants with CP. Each of them walked for two minutes under each of the two conditions. One is walking wearing shoes called the baseline and another is working with Biofeedback Plus assistance. Biofeedback was delivered through a visual interface, just like the one you see on the screen. It showed the uh, real-time user step length and the target step length. Ankle assistance was delivered through an adaptive controller. Basically, the device provided, uh, proportion, pro uh, provided ankle torque that is proportional to the user's biological ankle moment. Before I presented the um, quantitative results, I'd like to play the video uh, of the participants with the uh, most severe symptoms working under two conditions. And here are the videos of the participants with the mildest symptoms. Okay, so the first is the results is step lens. The top figure indicates that the growth step length was 14% greater in Biofeedback Plus assistance condition compared to baseline. The bottom row indicates all participants had increased step length working with Biofeedback Plus assistance. Here are the kinematics results, which can provide information on how people achieve longer steps. The bar chart on the left indicates a peak hip, knee, and ankle extension. Uh, of the group and the curves on the right showed the joint angles from one participant. So all participants had increased hip extension at late stance and the growth hip extension was six degree more during walking with biofeedback plus assistance compared to baseline. Peak knee extension was similar at the growth level. However, six out of seven participants had increased knee extension uh, working with biofeedback plus assistance. There's no difference in ankle angle between two conditions. The last set of results is muscle activity. For soleus and vastus lateralis, there's no difference in integral EMG between two conditions, indicating that even though participants are receiving assistance from the device, they're still engaged and using their own muscles. So the take home message is, biofeedback can increase the rate of improvement in gait mechanics and also increase user engagement during uh, working with wearable assistance. Using step lens as a feedback target, gave the user uh, the autonomy to choose their own strategies, and our cohort relied on the hip and knee versus the ankle to achieve longer steps. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Dean Molinero, and uh, feel free to go ahead and throw my head up by the ASB logo for your greatest viewing pleasure. 
Okay, hip exoskeletons are currently augmenting human energetics during walking. And when we look in the literature at what these exoskeletons are doing under the hood, we see two very common control strategies emerge. One is biological torque control, and the other is human in the loop optimization. Biological torque control really benefits uh, from real world viability, meaning that it has predefined assistance profiles based on parameter lookups of user and environmental states. Whereas human loop optimization really suffers from slow policy convergence due to the need to optimize to a given user's metabolic cost. However, human loop optimization really shows us the benefits of personalizing exoskeleton assistance to a given user, whereas biological torque control provides generic assistance based on normative biomechanics from the literature. And so what we asked ourselves is, is there a way to combine the benefits of real world viability with personalized exoskeleton assistance? And what we decided was to try replacing the parameter lookup of biological torque control with an instantaneous biological hip torque estimator via a neural network. This uh, estimate could then be used to update the exoskeleton assistance, which we believe would both uh, present a controller with real world viability as well as personalized assistance based on their individualized biomechanics. This type of control strategy would also have a pretty big bonus of potentially removing the need for high level state estimation or high level uh, control that's common in wearable robotics, but we can save that conversation uh, maybe for something in spatial chat. Now my ideal study would have been to implement this, uh, to implement this biological torque controller or estimator, uh, update assistance and measure a bunch of really cool human outcomes measures. But we all have to start somewhere. And for me, it was asking the question, is it possible to estimate biological hip torque using a neural network? And what I hypothesized was that the neural network estimator would reduce the estimation RMSE of biological hip torque compared to subject averaged profiles. So our study looks like five subjects walking over ground, up and down a bunch of inclines and declines and level ground conditions while wearing a, our robotic hip exoskeleton and operating in a transparent or zero impedance mode. We collected motion capture, force plate and force plate data to compute ground truth biological hip torque from OpenSim inverse dynamics. And from that data, we computed three baseline profiles of intersubject average hip torques through during level ground, ramp ascent and ramp descent walking. We use that ba those baseline profiles as a comparison uh, against our neural network estimator, which used the hip exoskeleton encoder and IMU sensors sectioned into sliding windows and extracted into meaningful features common in the wearable robotics community that were then passed to our, to our feed forward neural network to estimate the biological hip torque. We computed the estimation RMSE peak magnitude error and peak timing error of these of the neural network estimate and the baseline estimate compared to the ground truth hip torque profiles over a stride. And just as a quick example, if we look at the right, letting the red line represent the ground truth um, biological torque over a stride and the green line representing a really bad estimate that was drawn by me, we can see that we computed the peak magnitude error as the absolute difference between the uh, peak ground truth value and peak estimate, and the peak timing error as the absolute difference in gate phase between those two peaks as well. The time series here show representative steps of level ground ramp ascent and ramp descent walking as estimated by the feed forward neural network and the baseline method with the ground truth shown just to present a comparison. And what we found is that the neural network estimation our estimator did re significantly reduce the estimation RMSE compared to those baseline methods, allowing us to accept our hypothesis. And when we look at the underlying mechanisms for that improved uh, estimation, we found that the neural network estimator improved the peak magnitude error more than the peak timing error compared to that baseline method. And what that tells us is that neural network estimator was doing a better job of scaling the hip torque over a stride to account for changes such as those during different inclines and declines uh, or given or those in step to step variability. So really moving forward with this project, what we plan to do is increase our subject number, which will allow us to, to train subject independent neural network models for estimating that biological hip torque. And with those subject independent models, we can then implement these, this estimator in real time on board an exoskeleton controller, allowing us to quantify the human outcomes measures of this control strategy that would combine both personalized assistance with real world viability. 
Thank you to my colleagues, advisor, funding source, and for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Hi, my name is David Lee. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. The title of my presentation is Reducing Human Energetics Using a Bilateral Knee Exoskeleton. The field of power exoskeleton technology has been actively developed over the past years. The current gold standard measurement for human augmentation is metabolic cost. The contribution of the knee joint becomes greater during incline walking compared to the level ground walking, producing up to 25% of the total positive power generated by the lower limb joints. And this positive power generation is primarily present during the early stance phase through an extension moment. Thus, providing an extension torque assistance during the early stance phase using a knee exoskeleton is a promising strategy. Given this idea, there is an important question in that what is more optimal assistance to reduce the user's metabolic cost? We studied the differences in the biomechanical effectiveness of three different common assistance strategies using a bilateral knee exoskeleton, which are a biological torque controller, an impedance controller, and a proportional myelectro controller. The first one is the biological torque controller. Based on the estimated gate phase, a predefined parabolic shaped extension torque assistance is provided during the first 30% of the gate cycle. Another controller is an impedance controller, modeling a joint as a spring damper system. The controller regulates the torque output based on the input kinematics from the user, which allows the user to step up or step down the assistance by controlling their knee joint kinematics. The last one is the proportional myelectric controller. The controller uses the EMG signals from two knee extensor muscles as inputs. This feature allows the users to adjust the assistance timing and magnitude to their gait for the step-to-step -step variability in real time. These controllers allow different levels of ability in controlling the assistance to the user. Previous studies using hip and ankle exoskeletons demonstrated that myelectric controller led to a better biomechanical outcomes compared to the biological torque controllers. These results indicate that allowing the users to take more control of the assistance may be more beneficial than allowing less because the assistance becomes more synchronized to the user's intention. The first hypothesis of the study was that the assistance would reduce the metabolic cost of the user compared to the unassisted condition. The second hypothesis of the study was that the among the assistance strategies, the strategy allowing more controllability of the assistance to the user would yield a larger metabolic reduction than the strategy allowing less. Thus, we expected that the metabolic reduction would be the largest under the proportional myelectric controller, the second largest under the impedance controller, and the smallest under the biological tool controller. Nine everybody adults participated in this experiment. The subjects walked on a treadmill with 15% gradient incline surface at 1.1 meters per second. The first visit was designated for training. The subjects practiced walking under each assistance condition for 15 minutes. The second day was for data collection. The subjects walked for six minutes for each condition in a randomized order. To test the effectiveness of the assistance strategies, the comparison was performed between the assistance conditions and the unpowered condition. The results. As shown on the left plot, all assistance strategies provided the extension torque assistance during the early sense phase. Shown as the shaded region, the variation of the assistance profiles was the largest under the proportional myelectric controller, the second largest under the impedance controller, and the smallest under the biological torque controller. As shown on the right plot, there was no statistically significant differences between the controllers in the average assistance torque. All assistance conditions had a significantly lower metabolic cost than the unpowered conditions, showing approximately a 3% reduction. There was no significant differences in the metabolic cost between the assistance conditions. The knee extensor muscle group, including vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and rectus femoris, significantly reduced their activation with assistance. The knee flexor group did not show significant differences with assistance. There was no significant differences in the muscle activation levels between assistance conditions. Biomechanically, all assistance strategies significantly reduced the peak biological knee extension movement and positive power compared to the unpowered condition. However, there was no significant differences in these quantities between the assistance conditions. In conclusion, the first hypothesis, which is the assistance would reduce the metabolic cost of the user compared to the unassisted condition is accepted. However, the second hypothesis, which is that among the three assistance strategies, the metabolic reduction would be the largest under proportional myelectric controller, the second largest under the impedance controller, and the smallest 
under the biological Turk controller is rejected. The metabolic reduction was biomechanically caused by the significant reduction in the biological knee kinetic effort and the knee sensor muscle activation. In overall, the user's controllability of the assistance profile at the knee joint did not yield significant differences in biomechanical outcomes. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sabrina Abram. And let me just share my screen. Okay, um, today I'll be talking about how healthy individuals learn to take advantage of ankle exoskeleton assistance and reduce their metabolic cost of walking. So Katie Pogginsey, pictured here on the left, presented yesterday on her awesome study where she compared the benefits of training with a customization protocol of, um, to training with repeated exposure to a good generic assistance pattern. She found that with training over multiple days, participants learned to reduce their metabolic costs by large amounts with both customized and generic assistance. And here we performed a post hoc analysis of this study to determine how the nervous system learns to take advantage of the generic assistance. So generic assistance is particularly interesting as it is not customized to the user and yet they're still able to achieve large energy savings. So we tested three hypotheses. First, we hypothesize that people explore many candidate gait dimensions as they identify those that can have an effect on metabolic cost. This global increase in exploration may help the nervous system understand the energetic landscape of this new walking context. Second, we hypothesize that people then reduce this exploration along all gait dimensions with experience. For some, for some dimensions, there may be no benefit to exploring at all as it may increase costs or not have an effect. For other dimensions, exploration may result in lower metabolic cost, um, which, leads us, which leads us to our third hypothesis that people systematically adapt along gate dimensions and exploit new energy optimal strategies. We determined how participants learn to walk with repeated exposure to generic assistance as shown in the figure on the right, and then compare this to their baseline preferences with normal walking or zero torque. In our generic assistance setup, participants walked while wearing a bilateral torque controlled ankle exoskeleton where the pattern of assisted torque was controlled as a function of stride time. We defined the generic torque profile by four parameters that were consistent across participants. The nature of this torque control allowed some gait dimensions to influence its performance. For example, uh, step frequency could influence torque timing, whereas ankle kinematics could influence the power and work applied to the ankle. We quantified learning at the level of the whole movement, the joint, and the muscle through gait dimensions of step frequency ankle kinematics, and total soleus and medial gastroc muscle activity. We selected these specific gait dimensions based on our understanding of how people could take advantage of the torque control and our, and our intuition of how they might learn to accept the external work being applied. As Katie detailed yesterday, participants first completed validation trials on day zero and then an adaptation trial followed by validation trials on days one through five. Validation trials consisted of uh, normal walking conditions as well as zero torque and generic assistance. Prior to the experiment, we also randomly assigned participants to either a static group as shown in the top row or a continued optimization group shown in the bottom row. The important take home of this slide is that despite differences in their adaptation trials, all participants experienced the generic assistance shown in the blue here um, on each day and, and for multiple days. First, we looked at how people explored new strategies along our measure gait dimensions. So here we have walking time with exoskeleton assistance along the x-axis and step to step variability normalized to participants average normal walking baseline values along the y-axis. We found that for step frequency, participants initially had increased variability compared to their baseline levels indicated by the value one here along on the y-axis. They then exponentially decreased variability with experience and converged on their baseline values. And we found similar results for total soleus activity. For ankle angle and total medial gas shock activity, participants' variability also increased and then decreased exponentially, however, remained elevated above their, above their baseline levels. We next estimated the relationship between gait dimensions shown here on the x-axis and metabolic costs shown on the y-axis to guide our uh, predictions about how the nervous system may adapt. We found that the slopes of the relationships between metabolic cost and step frequency, total soleus activity, 
and total medial gas shock activity were significantly different from zero. However, we did not find a relationship between ankle angle range and metabolic cost. Interestingly, we found that participants indeed adapted along these three gate dimensions of step frequency, total solace activity, and total medial gas shock activity. This is shown here um, with ex walking time um, in the exoskeleton assistance along the x-axis and gate dimensions normalized to baseline values along the y-axis. Our previous slide also indicated that um, ankle angle range may not have a systematic effect on metabolic cost, and here we found that participants did not adapt along this gate dimension. So these results have addressed each of our hypotheses.